y'all. I'm Jamie Harris, and you're watching the time. Oh my gosh, thanks for inviting me. Happy to be here. Yeah, last time I saw you was just uh, recently. At, it was good to see you at uh, South by in, in Austin. It was, uh, it was a great time, great week, huh? Oh yeah, absolutely. I love like, it felt really mellow this year, which is really nice. I think um, as far as my memory recalls, it was South by Southwest was the first big thing to get canceled. You know, that it fell before the NBA or anything else. And I think that was the very first sign that we really were dipping into something serious. So to have it be back this year in the way that it was, I think everyone was in a great mood and just really happy to see us kind of coming back to the surface. Yeah, yeah it was it was a great mood. And and we didn't have to wear masks for the most part, which was just, oh, it feels so good. And I know that I know that we're not completely done. Uh, and and I, for example, I'm going to the doctor tomorrow and I have to remember to bring my mask in that context. But how, let me just ask you, how have you fared these last two years? How, what's the pandemic been like for you? I know it's been difficult for all of us, especially those of us who perform music, but I know you've done some live streams and some other things. In general, how have you fared over these last two years? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, I think that I had a relatively easy pandemic. We were able to pivot pretty quickly. And uh, there was kind of this month long period where we were just kind of free falling. Like before anyone had really figured out how to move online, before Zoom was really happening. And in a way, I mean, from my perspective, I went from living in Austin, which I loved, you know, for 10 years and working a full-time job to quitting my day job, going on the road full-time, transitioning between playing with a full band to being a solo troubadour artist, which was really difficult for me because I discovered very quickly that that is a completely different art form. And it made me like rethink the way I wrote songs. And like for me, public speaking is like my worst nightmare. So like that was terrifying. So I spent two years doing that and pretty much like in a lot of ways that was very exciting, but it was also really lonely because I was really struggling with that. And it felt like I couldn't, when people asked me, oh, how are things going? Or actually a lot of times they wouldn't ask. They would just say, oh, it looks like things are going really well. And I felt weird about saying, actually it's really lonely or I'm really struggling. Um, I feel like I've been given this great opportunity and I'm not handling it very well. I'm still not ready. And I know there are a bunch of musicians that are ready that would, you know, really be great in the position that I'm in. So for me, oddly, when the pandemic happened and we like everyone was kind of checking in with each other and we were online, I felt more connected than I had in the previous two years. Yeah. Um, unusual, I guess. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but that, you know, I've, I've talked to this. Uh, about this to other folks as well it, it's it's interesting how yeah it sucked in a lot of ways and and I mean a lot of people died and, and it was just horrible but there were some silver linings and one of them is that we discovered new ways to connect with each other and and live streaming I think is something that do you see that continuing now and I, I mean it's it seems like a, we've discovered a new way to to share music and to connect with people and I kind of see that continuing even after COVID do you I do. I think a few, maybe if you'd asked me a year ago, I would have assumed that we'd have more of a hybrid situation when it came to live shows. Um, as far as a lot of venues, like I know City Winery and some other venues have built in um, live streaming technology. I think Mucky Duck has been really successful with that as well. Mm -hmm. Really, really successful. And they're reaching a global audience now. And all these people that, you know, saw Pat Byrne in Ireland that can't wait to travel to Houston, Texas and, yeah. you know, yeah. eat and see Pat live at the Mucky Duck. And I think that's really beautiful. I would have thought more venues would have gone in that direction. Um, but what I didn't think about until I guess I was talking to someone from a venue who was saying, well, the problem with that is that we're going to have to do radius clauses for the internet. And how do you mm -hmm. do that? And I'm like, wow, that's a challenge I hadn't considered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, But yeah, I mean, I think, I definitely think the format of the show that I did with Mary Gaucher is that, you know, we had a different songwriter on every week. And so right. it was, you know, maybe four to eight songs throughout the entire show, but a lot of conversation about the creative process, mm -hmm. you know, how each songwriter was handling things differently. And I think a lot of us too, like, you know, James McMurtry is one, I'm a huge McMurtry fan, um, watched him do a lot of live streams and 
um, I think that really broke him out of his, you know, the show that he does every Tuesday and Wednesday, he was right. going through his catalog and fans love that. And so I think there is a place for both. Yeah, absolutely. But I do think it depends on the personality as well of who's hosting it, the format of the show sure. Um, sure. and, you know, what, what the fan base is as far as whether or not that's going to resonate. Yeah. And by the way, thank you for, you played my live stream twice uh, last year. I, I really appreciate that. I think one of the things about the places like Mucky Duck hosting is one of the things we, we forget is they make a lot of their money selling drinks, food oh, yeah. and drinks, and, and that's, that's missing. Well, listen, I want to get to a little bit of biograph that, you know, the point of this is not to just have a music interview or just discuss your bio. My, my idea about that is people can, uh, these days, people can find out biographical information easily enough on you. I do want to ask you some questions about that. But before I jump into kind of more biographical things, I want to ask you about what you're doing in terms of recording. I know, you know, Red Rescue is huge for you. And, and but gosh, that's, that's four years ago. I can't believe it. And I know you've, you've put out some singles since then. I'm just wondering what your plans are. I'm also wondering, this is something I've been grappling with, with, with my musical projects is that, are we done with albums? Is it just going to be singles now? I hope not. Are, you know, is, is the era of the album gone? What's your approach to that? And what are your plans right now? What are you doing recording wise? Well, my approach to the question you asked about full length albums is that I'm a folk singer. I really consider myself a folk singer in the way that Towns Van Zandt or Guy Clark, Nancy Griffith, that realm of I guess like a Texas folk singer, you know, mm -hmm. and, and for me, um, I, I, I still consume music in album format. I, I love the idea of, you know, 10 to 12 songs fitting together sonically and yeah. And thematically, I think there's something important for that. And for me, I believe that in some ways that really helps me in my writing process because it was yeah. kind of weird because I just wrote and wrote and wrote, right? I started playing when I was five years old. I started writing when I was 14, but I didn't put out a wow. record until I was 28, right? So mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was like to kind of, not that I'm writing for a record, but I did kind of have the benefit of, of the first one going, okay, I've got all of, all of these songs, you know, what's gonna make the record? And two of them still had to be written in the process. And for me with this last record, um, during the kind of the, I guess the part of the pandemic where we had been vaccinated, but it was pre-Delta. I went down to Austin and made a record with Mark Hallman. Oh, that's right, you did. I'm sorry, I, I spaced on that. Yeah. You sure did, yeah. No, it's cool. And and so um, he, and it's not out yet. It'll come out in January, 2023, because I got yeah. a little distribution deal for it, which is really exciting for me. And that's so great. working, you know, working with Mark and Andre, it was really great because most of the record is just the three of us, um, okay. which we figured would be a really good record to make in COVID, you know, based on, and I thought it was exciting to work with that limitations and also just to fully let Mark do what Mark was going to do, because I really trust him. And, and I think no one knows my voice better than him. And I, I just really trust him with that. And so for this process of, you know, of a, a record, like I mentioned earlier, I really struggled when I went from playing with a full band to playing solo and doing this yeah. troubadour thing. But I do think it made me grow as a songwriter because it made me Definitely. Go, okay, how do I use different narrators? To, you know, what, what is the best point of view to tell this story? What can I talk about to tell mm -hmm. the story? Like, I want to talk about, you know, gun violence, right, in a way that isn't hokey. And so uh, I wrote a song from the perspective of, a, of the mother of a child that I went to school with that was shot and killed accidentally by his best friend in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. So I've grown in that way, and the pandemic allowed me a lot of time to edit I've really, really grown in my editing process. And so the next record is definitely more of a folk singer songwriter record. And that's, I really wanted to lay the foundation of that um, as well, because I would like to do something in the future where I do stuff that I wouldn't put in my own songs naturally with my voice, like singing intensely. Cause that's another thing I've learned being solo on stage. Like, oh, all I have to work with is my voice and my guitar and the song. So all three of those need to do something, you know, and really powerful. And I've been afraid to really use my voice the way I would with, let's say, Western youth, because right. I don't want to be known as a chick singer. I want to be taken seriously as a songwriter. And, you know, Towns Van Zant wasn't necessarily like how, howling or something in, in, in his songs. Um, so yeah, all of that, you know, once, once I wrote early on the pandemic, I wrote a song called Boomerang Town. It took me 
several months to write and it's kind of the story I've been trying to write ever since I started writing making sense of the small town in Texas that I grew up in. And in order to do that, I had to try writing from the perspective of a lot of different people. Um, I tried writing from the perspective of a waitress that works at a diner in Crawford, Texas. I tried writing from the perspective of a pregnant teenager. And I found that the best, I tried to write it from my perspective and I found out that wasn't going to work. And so the most truthful way I was able to get to that song was writing it from the pers perspective of a 17 year old boy that had just knocked up his girlfriend and was working at Walmart. Mm -hmm. You know, and so once I had that song and it, um, I kind of knew where where the record was going and it allowed me to kind of focus my writing in a not a, in too intensely way, because if I had focused too intensely, like I'm going to make 10 songs, this is going to be an album that people are going to listen to from mm -hmm. beginning to end. If I had imposed my will too strongly on it, I probably wouldn't have gotten the quality of songs that I did. But I did need that benchmark to keep writing. Gotcha. Anyway, and <laughs> it, it does. Absolutely. And and. Uh... You mentioned editing, and I want I, I want to return to that because uh you know one of the things I know we all struggle with whether whatever kind of writer we are or painter any kind of artist we are is when do we you know when is it done and to what extent do we trust that first draft and and how do we stay objective I think that's all stuff we could talk about because I've heard you say before I really loved something you said uh, in another interview you said something like you recognize that a particular song came to you before you were really ready to 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 write it and, and that's that's extremely wise and something i should probably listen to myself because that's i think too often we rush these things out we have this great idea it sounds great and, and we feel this compelled to to finish it and uh i think you even referenced leonard cohen in that interview because he was somebody who would sit on songs for years uh and until he knew it was ready uh, well, let's back up, if we will. You mentioned small town. Where where did you uh, where did you grow up? In you were here in Texas in a small town. What was it? Yeah, so I grew up in Hewitt, Texas, which is a suburb of Waco. Waco. Yeah, I spent some time in Waco. You uh, did. <laughs> I did. My I I grew up my high school years. I, I was born in the Kansas City area and spent most of my youth there. High school years in Northern Virginia, Falls Church. But in my senior year. My parents moved to Waco, Texas, and they they offered to let me stay and finish, graduate from my high school in Virginia, but Waco sounded so cool. It sounded like the Old West or something to me, and wow, that was a little bit of a disappointment. I, I Sorry, yeah. Waco. Sorry, Waco people. Uh, it, it was tough, but uh, I know that was, that was uh, a long, long time ago. I know things have changed now, but so what was your youth like? Uh, what were you like as a kid? You mentioned you started you started playing guitar at, and and uh, at a pretty early age. But but what were you, what kind of kid were you? What were you like? Oh, that's a great question. I I don't know if I remember enough. I <laughs> you know I remember my um, well. First of all, my parents had me when they were twenty. Uh -huh. So my parents once my dad figured out that my mother was pregnant and that they were going to get married and make it work. Um, he looked on a map and saw, you know, what's the cheapest places to live in Texas that also has a university. And that was Nacogdoches. So that's actually mm. where I was born. And my gotcha. parents put themselves both through college at the same time, graduated within like four years, which is incredible to yeah, me. It's amazing. Um, and then my dad played cover songs or in a band, um, playing cover songs at the bars around town. So in a lot of ways, because I hung out with my parents a lot, and I spent a lot of time with my dad during the day, um, I was always around people that were older than me, but kind of cool, you know, like we're into music or into, I remember a good friend of my dad's that was into Star Trek, and I thought that was just the coolest thing, like, you know, so he had like a, a little Lego version of the Enterprise, and I was just fascinated with that as a kid. So it was kind of nerdy in a way, but music was, I mean, pretty... From, from the beginning, pretty formative for me. And I remember, I mean, Amy Lou Harris hearing her voice on a Christmas song that just like mesmerized me. And then it was oh, Tracy yeah. Chapman and then it was Fleetwood Mac and, you know, all these things that built me. But for the most part, I mean, I always kind of got, I wasn't popular, but I got along with a lot of different types of groups of people. And I feel like ever since I was young, people would tell me stuff that they might not, I, just like, from first time, they would tell me something uh, you probably wouldn't tell a stranger or an acquaintance, but mm -hmm. they just felt safe with me. And I don't know 
exactly what that is. But I spent a lot of time with my grandparents as well, um, especially when we moved back to Waco and my dad was put himself through law school again, like waiting tables and playing cover songs in a band. And my grandmother was the assistant children's minister at um, the First Baptist Church of Waco. So I spent a lot of time in the church. That's really where I learned how to sing, I think, in a lot of ways, too. Um, equal to my dad, it was those Baptist, you know, Baptist hymns. Um, and I, that was like a real a huge part of my life and by choice. My parents never forced me to believe anything. I was really into it. That was really my community. And the older I got, the more and more I got involved um, with the church. And I was really studious as well. Um, it was really important to me. I, I knew I wanted to live in Austin. So I thought, well, I got to go to UT, you know, and from an early age, I, I took on a lot. I actually believe I got burnt out before I, before I went to college, which is why I didn't like stick with college very long because I worked so hard in high school that I think I burned myself out. Wow. I was a rule follower, you know, I, I just, I, I really was. Um, so not, you know, not too thrilling, not too exciting, just a regular kid, but I felt like I knew that there was something beyond the town that I lived in and I didn't mm -hmm. know what it was that made me want to get out because I had great parents. I had a great community, you know. Mm -hmm. um, one thing was I was uh, I was always pretty heavy. And so I didn't necessarily get teased a lot for it. I remember fifth grade was particularly difficult. I kind of had this one bully. Um, but I also think that's why I gravitated towards music because physically I felt awkward in the world, even though mm -hmm. I belonged. And music gave me a way to escape and imagine a, a different world that I wasn't living in. You, you really are someone who has transformed your life in a lot of ways and, and taken charge uh, of, of, and not just kind of been a victim and waiting for life to happen to you. I mean, uh, just the, your whole journey of becoming a songwriter. I, I think, I, did I see a 10-year challenge kind of a photograph of you speaking of losing weight? And, and I know you're on a sober journey as well. And, and I just, uh, I'm just uh, really impressed and my hats off to you. Kudos for some, you're, you're just uh, clearly someone who says, I, I'm not going to life, let life happen to me. I'm going to make it happen the way I want to. And that's a beautiful thing. Hey, let me, let me, if I can, I don't want to keep you too long today. I, let me hit you with some, some phrases, some words, some people names, okay. and just have you almost a Rorschach test. You can just say a couple words, what these things mean to you, or you can talk about it if you want. Okay. Uh, they're going to be provocative things, though, for you in particular, I think. Okay. So first, Kerrville Folk Festival. Home. Home. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you remember the first year you went? I do remember the first year I went. I went with my friend, Betty Sue, um, because I, went, I, I did it kind of backwards. For those of you who might not know the folk community, there are all these little conferences, the biggest one being Folk Alliance, and then there are regional conferences that is a way for other folk singers to meet each other. Um, and it's a way for folk singers to connect with the music business, right? Venues, house concert promoters, booking agents, that kind of thing. And um, so I went to a thing called Surfa, or Swerfa, I guess, the Southwest, right? And um, version of that. And everyone kept talking about Kerrville, Kerrville, Kerrville. You're, oh, it's like it is at Kerrville. And I said, I've never been to Kerrville. And so my friend Betty Sue said, I'll take you to Kerrville. And it was the year that Amy Lou Harris and Rodney Crowell were playing. And as I mentioned before, I mean, I mean, insane Amy Lou Harris fan. She's like, she's like the top of my, you know, I just, I yeah. love her so much. And that year there was this really crazy flood. And so Amy Lou and Rodney ended up playing at the YO, um, which is a hotel in town in Kerrville. Yep. My friend said, well, you know, would you like to, you know, go? There's like a short period of time where we could have made it out. And I said, no, I've seen Amy Lou plenty of times. I've never been like stuck in the rain in Kerrville. I'm yeah. not knowing that there would be also many opportunities for that to happen. Right, right, right. But that's like, that's the year. I mean, my, my good friend. Do you remember which year it is? It was? It was 2015. 2015. And I ended yeah. up, all these things happened to me that if you're familiar with Kerrville, they would mean something to you. But all these things happened to me on the very first night and the second day I was there that I didn't realize don't always happen to a lot of people. Jimmy LaFave was still alive. I ended up on mm -hmm. stage with him the first night and, wow. you know, and it was magical. And I really did feel like I had found my community because kind of first when I was in Austin, I was more in a hipster community, which never really fit me. Um, but it's just what I knew. It was some people I, I was working with were in that realm. And so Stepping on the ground with, you know, where you didn't have to explain who Towns Van Zant was or, right. you know, 
<laughs> that was that yeah. was exciting for me. Yeah, I I actually uh, I'm fortunate that my parents lived in Kerrville, so we didn't we weren't in Waco very long. I went off to college in Denton, and this is in the olden days. I'm old. Uh, I was either at the second or the third festival in 75 or 76. Wow. Uh, and I, I knew nothing about it. Like you, I, I mean, I, uh, someone said something about Kerrville Folk Festival, and I said, you know, what's that? And uh, wow, I, I could tell you some stories. Did you, I, I'm assuming you met Wes Collins there as well. You know, I didn't meet Wes at Kerrville. Okay. We met the following year at Swarfa. And gotcha. the thing, we immediately started talking about cluster headaches, which are a rare form of, um, it's similar to migraines, uh, in, except for that, I mean, as far as if you're explaining it to somebody, the difference is, is with the migraine, I believe the, the blood vessels contract and with cluster headaches, they expand. Mm. And they cause um, uh, amnesia, uh, intense pain. A lot of people describe it as feeling like a rod going through their eye. And I don't know how we got to that topic so quickly, but we re but we did because my dad um, suffers from those and so does Wes. Mm. And I think mm. a lot of beautiful songs that he um, writes kind of come from that experience of being trapped in that. It's kind of like you're it, like on in the middle of the veil, like you're not on either side of it, but you're just in this weird realm. And I just enjoyed talking to him so much that I mm -hmm. went and saw him play and then I begged him relentlessly to ask me to sing on his next record, which thankfully he <laughs> did because I yeah. became a super fan. I was thinking 2015, may have been 2016 when he won Best New Artist uh, at Kerrville. That's why I was thinking maybe you had met him then. But he let me move 20, on. Yeah, he won 2015. 15, did he? I missed his performance. Yeah. Gotcha. So uh, let me move on. Um, Eliza Gilkison. Hero. Hero. Graham Weber. The best. Tell, do, you, do you mind talking about, I, I, there's something, I don't know what it is, but there's something with you and Graham. And when I, I'm, I'm actually going to be talking to Graham, I think tomorrow, sometime this week. And, and I asked him, is there anything you want to talk about? And he said, I want to talk about Jamie. Oh. <laughs> and he said, and he, and he said, and you should ask her to talk about me too. Oh, happy to. <laughs> Yeah, Graham and I met, um, there's a place in South Austin that has just reopened as uh, Captain Quack Soundstage, but it was called Strange Brew. Um, and I got invited to be a part of a tribute show there, and it was uh, Tom Petty and Tom Waits alternating. Okay, and tribute. I sang, I, For a second, a I thought you were saying they were, no. okay, yeah. No, that's good to clarify. This is why I write songs, because I'm able to really clearly say. <laughs> um, so... I did a Tom Petty song and Graham was right after me and he did a wait song and he watched my performance and was like, who is this? I really love this. And I watched Graham's, although I can't remember what, what song it was that he did now, but I was like, wow, this guy is great. Yeah. Um, and then I can't exactly remember how we really began hanging out and spending time with each other. Um, but once we, once we did, I just, man, he's so warm and he's yeah. really, a, a, he wants he's really good at connecting people, not just, oh, you should know so-and-so, but um, he's really good at connecting the right people, you know, putting them together. And then I discovered that I really, really enjoyed not only singing with Graham, but writing with Graham. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do, do some of that during the pandemic on Zoom, but we also went on this great adventure where we toured New York City for two and a half weeks. So we played in almost every borough in the city. And Nice. Yeah, Rockaway Beach, the Governor's Island, like we just, we just did uh, all these spaces together. But I think that like, I really love Graham's approach to songwriting. I love um, his integrity. I love that he also can straddle the rock and roll world and the, and yeah. the folk world. Um, I think we're coming from a very similar place. And, and he's taught me a lot mm -hmm. uh, about being a great songwriter. Nice. And I love him. And yeah. I love I love his family. I love his daughter. Yeah. I love his wife. Just, just all good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You, you guys are clearly very connected and I think you're both really empathic people and you, you probably share some, something there. Uh, Peter Blackstock. Champion. Mm. John Prime. Oh, you can talk more about Peter. Yeah, I was thinking, I mean, when you mentioned Kerrville, like Kerrville in my mind was really the first 
I think they were the first festival to like take a chance on me. And, uh, and that was a big deal. And Peter Blackstock, I remember actually being at Kerrville um, the year that I, that I played it and Peter Blackstock wrote a, wrote a big article about me. And um, I really think he played a, has played a huge part in me having a career. And the, the other connection is that, you know, in Waco, I don't know what it was like when you lived there, but there wasn't a local radio station there. Right. There wasn't a, um, a local record store there. And so uh, when my dad took me to Waterloo and took me to the, you know, ACL festival, I got a copy of No Depression. I was like, the Flatlanders, like, who, who are these? Yeah. You know, in my, like, I see you've got all this Bob Dylan stuff behind you. It's framed and nice and everything. But my teenage bedroom was like, all right, I'll take out a picture of like Hanson because I still to this day love Hanson. But I also That's had great. You know, pictures from, um, you know, pulled out of No Depression of the Flatlanders and other artists that yeah. they turned me on to. So I also think that I wouldn't have the musical foundation I have if it wasn't for Peter being involved with, with No Depression. And I didn't even know that until years of me uh, yeah. being aware of, of Peter as an Austin journalist. I think I've shared with you before, Peter and I go way, way back. Uh, we met at a 10,000 Maniac show in, I think it was 87, something like that. And one of those, one of the issues of no depression, my friends call it the, the cry check issue because the, do you remember, what was it called? The, there was a page at the beginning where it, usually it was Peter or sometimes it was his partner who would write that just kind of basically it was named after a Wilco song, maybe, or I mean, a, a, a Tupelo song, Screen Door or something like that. But anyway, it's not he, wrote, about, yeah. he, wrote, he wrote about my wedding and my bachelor party, which was a bunch of guys sitting around trading songs. Wow. And, and he sang at, at my wedding. So uh, we go way back and, and I, I, have a, I have a big place in my heart for Peter. Love that man. Uh, okay. You mentioned Bob because you see Bob here. I've been asking all my guests, what about Bob? What, you know, what, what kind of impact he has on you? What do you think about him, et cetera? How do you think about Bob? Yeah, it's funny. If Mary was here, she'd be like, he's the greatest songwriter of all time. I feel like I have, com I mean, do I think he's an incredible songwriter? Absolutely. You know, um, I feel like I have a weird, it's not Bob's fault, but, but the question, I have a, it's not Bob's fault, but actually the first thing that comes into my mind when I think about Bob Dylan is this question that I've been asking, actually I've been asking journalists, I haven't had the chance to ask Peter this question, I don't think, but I've been thinking about since Bob Dylan, and of course I don't know because I was born in, you know, 1990, um, is it okay if I ask you a question, I guess? <laughs> so, no, of course, yeah. So here's what, I've been thinking a lot about the idea of the greatest songs in the world, which I totally believe that Bob Dylan has written some of, a lot of the greatest songs mm -hmm. in the world, being mm -hmm. paired with the greatest singers in the world. Mm -hmm. Like Emmylou Harris, if you get an Emmylou Harris, Linda Ronstadt, even Liza Minnelli, George Strait, mm -hmm. Frank Sinatra, any of those cuts, they're not gonna move the song around, you know, in the way they're gonna sing the song as it was written, they're gonna pick incredible songs and they're gonna sing them with integrity. They're not gonna over sing mm -hmm. them, you know, they just have a really deep understanding of songs. So my question about the post Bob Dylan era is, is there this idea that in order to be an authentic artist, particularly a folk singer, with the exception of Joan Baez, I guess, who also does as well, I should include this, her name in that conversation. But is, it, is there an idea that you have to sing and play your own songs in order to be an authentic artist? And is Bob Dylan responsible mm. for that, even though he didn't ask to be? Because my question is, who now yeah. is taking the taking the best songs in the world and singing them with one of the best voices in the world? And I don't know. But that is the conversation that I think about when I think about Bob Dylan. Yeah, I don't know if that's true. Um, and it's something I just haven't really struggled to, you know, it's something I haven't thought about. But if it were true, I, I think absolutely Dylan would be uh, one of the primary... Uh, people responsible for that you know i i'm i geek out on dylan a lot and uh and part of it is because of my age and the fact that i was there uh when when he turned the world around when he turned it upside down and not single-handedly but he had a huge part in it 
And I mean, it's just hard for for someone, and I don't mean to pull the age rank on you, but it's sure. hard for someone born in 1990 to really, you can hear this, but to really have been through a time when suddenly he he was one of the first people to turn lyrics into literature. And exactly. it just didn't happen. It didn't happen before that. And 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 it's it's so common and taken for granted now that it's hard to 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 think. And and one of the things I remind people of is Brian Wilson, uh, you know, of the Beach Boys. He said something like he had this moment when he listened to Dylan, where he went, "Oh, we can do that." And exactly. John John Lennon did the same thing, you know. And and uh, Steve Earle has a thing uh, has an Audible exclusive. That's fantastic uh, that he reads and plays on, and it's called something like the moment in 1965 when rock and roll became art or became literature or something like that. And he says it was a moment when John Lennon wanted to be Bob Dylan and Bob Dylan wanted to be John Lennon, and and they they just you know they just changed the world in such a way. But I know part of it too is is my age. But let me just ask you this: uh -huh. if if Bob knocked on your door right now and said, "Hey, Jamie, I hear you're a songwriter." What play me one of your songs? What would you play for him? Oh, I would play Boomerang Town because to me that's the song that I mostly has that's the song for me that's been mostly directly inspired by Woody Guthrie. And that's something that I really appreciate Bob for as well, is he's someone who has carried on the legacy of Woody Guthrie, who of course is, you know, one of his heroes, if not his top hero. And I agree with you about this literature. Actually, yeah. Mary and I just got back from New Orleans because we were part of um two literature festivals that were ha happening at the same time. One is the Tennessee Williams Festival and the other a literary festival and the other is the Saints and Centers, which is an all, it's actually the only all LGBTQ literary festival. And they, rec they Mary wrote a book, but they inducted her into the Literary Hall of Fame there. Wow. And we had this discussion about, which I do believe that great songwriting is absolutely literature. You know, yeah. Bob Dylan winning the Nobel Prize, I, I think right on, and and yeah. I agree. I agree, and and I would like to put my hat in the conversation of, I think it's time that we have a literature, more literature recognition for songwriters, because Amen. of course, Amen. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for Bob Dylan, and Bob Dylan probably wouldn't be doing what he was doing if it wasn't for Woody Guthrie. Like for right. sure, I, I consider myself in that lineage. And talk about lit you know literate songwriters, Nancy Griffith. You know, John Prine, I put Steve Rowe in that category, absolutely. Of course, what Mary is doing, um, Gretchen Peters, Eliza Gilkison. Um, I I absolutely believe that as a, I think songwriting is sacred and I think it's a super high art, art form. And I think it should be recognized as such people working in the tradition that of course, Dylan champion, champions still. Well, you are, you're firmly in that tradition and um, getting more and more recognition that is well deserved. Uh, uh, how did you feel when NPR called you the next queen of Americana folk? I'll take it. <laughs> Hell yeah. Well, well, well. Hey, I, I, let me hit you with a few more quick questions, and then if you will, I'd love for you to, if you don't mind, play it. You want to play a song for us as, to take us out here at the Be end? Happy to do. Fantastic. Well, let me hit you with just a couple of kind of quick, rapid questions. Uh, most memorable show that you've attended. Well, I think that I'd have to say when I saw Amy Lou Harris, Julie Miller, Buddy Miller, and Patty Griffin all on stage together nice. at the very first Austin City Limits Music Festival because I became a songwriter after that. And my grandmother told me when I got home, she said, oh, Julie Miller, she said, I go to Bible study with her mother. And I was like, wait, she's like, yeah, and Julie Miller's from Waco. So seeing like someone that had lived in Waco that was playing, singing, with Amy Lou Harris and had written a song that Amy Lou Harris recorded made it seem possible to me. Fantastic. Uh, by the way, I hope you will agree to a part two of this because I, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to take a lot more of your time, but I've got so many questions uh, that I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear your responses to um, who would you like to play on a bill with that you've never played? Who would you like to share a stage with that you've never shared a stage with? That's a tie for me. I would love, I would love the opportunity to sing with Mavis Staples. Wow. But as far as an actual show, um, it would be an honor for me to share a show with James McMurtry. I, I would think that's doable. 
Wow. <laughs> yeah, I think he. I think Possibly. you should re- reach out to him. Possibly, I would never. <laughs> I, you know, you should. I, you I, should. I, I wish. That's. I know he's. Uh, I, some two of my actually, two of my very best friends, Bonnie Whitmore and Betty Sue. We have a text, a group message that has been going on for years. We talk to each other all day long, texting, and um, both of them uh, have opened and toured with James and. I, that would just be such an honor for me because uh, it would be also just a thrill to every night listen to what he does and watch what he does. I think he's a master. I think he would be honored to have you do that too. What pisses you off? (laughs) Hmm. I can't even say, I can't say it. Okay, it's all right. It's okay. <laughs> I what, just, it's a direct, I don't want to go in that direction. No, it's okay. That's all right. That's all, you, you absolutely have the right to refuse to answer any of these questions. You know what? I, I will do, the edited version of that is that there are, only, that there are, I think, less than 10 women in the Songwriting Hall of Fame. Oh, my God. I think yeah. there are only nine. That pisses me off. That's I the mean, short version of the long things 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 are changing it it's it's taken way too long but you've got to also to some extent putting on a different hat there be happy that things are finally changing um my god it's 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 crazy uh let's see if, if this is an unfair question but it's a okay. super cliche one that we all get you're on the deserted island and you can only take one album what is it Wrecking Ball, Amy Lou Harris. Okay. It's got all of the great songwriters, right? Olney, Dylan. Yep. Neil Young, Julie Miller. Yep. That's that's my one. How do you, what do you do to deal with the inevitable slings and arrows of life? Do you have a meditation practice or do you have some, uh, some, uh, some other kind of practice to just to deal with the shit that we all have to deal with? Yeah, I mean, several things for sure. I work on it. I'm, I'm intentional about it. I, um, I do morning pages every day. I uh, did, you know, the artist way, Julia Cameron's thing. And, and that helps me a lot. I meditate. I've been in 12 step recovery, um, mm-hmm. multiple, multiple 12 step programs. And that really, really helps me mm-hmm. a lot. Stay centered and just to, you know, be right sized. And I think a lot of it too, um, you know, <laughs> I think Ray, Ray Wiley, uh, you know, has, is famous for quoting this, uh, which I believe is adapted from something, but he says, you know, the days I keep my gratitude higher than my expectations end up being really good days. I agree with that. Like when you asked, you know, what did you think when the NPR called you, you know, the next queen, I just went, that's cool. You know, and I try not to take it in. And, and one of the, the good things about songwriting is that there's always a blank page. And I think, my, I'm really glad, like I, I grew up with Maren Morris, who is very clearly going to be a superstar. She has that star power, that drive, the voice, just everything. And for me, that was, it was never my goal to be famous. It's always been my, my goal to write the best possible songs that I can and tell the stories I can tell. And I think that helps me a lot. I think it would be a lot harder if I wanted to be famous, if I wanted, I don't know, if I wanted to be rich, I think yeah. that might be harder. <laughs> Well, do you have advice for young songwriters getting started? I know it probably depends on the context, depends on the person, but is there any kind of wisdom that you that you found yourself giving advice to younger people? Well, I think I learned something new this weekend that I would encourage every song. Well, there are two things. I can't just keep it to one. That's, that's my style, as you might have picked up on. One is that one thing that I wish that I had done sooner in my songwriting practice was to take a songwriting workshop. Um, I didn't take one. The first one I took was in 2017 with Mary Gaucher, wow. Eliza Gilson, and Gretchen Peters. And I learned so much. And some of it is like, you know, little tricks that really help me when I'm collaborating. Other things, you know, just the encouragement. And um, it also allowed me to, to recognize things that I was already doing in my writing that unconsciously that I'm now able to do consciously, which helps me tremendously. But the second piece of advice that I would give, and I just I just discovered this for myself this weekend is go to a literary conference, Mm -hmm. see what great authors are doing. Listen, Mm -hmm. 
you know, at these, of course, you know, Folk Alliance, Americana, all that stuff has been incredibly helpful for me in my career. But I think a lot of times young songwriters or people getting started want to know, how can I get a manager? How can I get a booking agent? Yeah. How can I? We're really focused on the business and we think, oh, we just, we've got the songs figured out. You know, that we, I'm, I'm good with that part. But I think if the songs are really, really great, all the other stuff will fall into place. And I think a way to do that is to hear how authors work. Mm. Yeah. Are you familiar with the poet Elizabeth Bishop? Yeah, I am. This is a, a poster from a Bishop conference I went to in Key West back in the 90s. That was an incredible, incredible experience. Wow. She was she was going to be the topic of my dissertation at one time, uh, and, and that never happened. But uh, that that's a conversation for another time, because I just want a couple quick questions and ask you to, to, to sing a song. Uh, here's a, a really heavy one. What happens when we die? I'm just really glad I don't think that I know the answer to that. Actually, I'm confident that I don't know the answer to that. And I think that's really great because I think that's what allows us to create and find meaning in our daily lives and particularly with art. And that's, I wanna keep working in that realm. So I'm not gonna to attempt to, yeah, that's, <laughs> to try no, to I, figure that out. <laughs> I, love, I love that answer because when people say to me, I don't know, my follow-up to that is usually, are you okay with not knowing? And, uh, and you went right there. And I, I think that's wise. Uh, well, when you are dead and gone, what, what do you hope people say about you? Well, I hope that they felt that I was kind to them. I hope that they remember, you know, it's, there's a quote, and of course I'm gonna screw it up, but you know, it's like people may not remember what exactly what you did or what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And I hope that that's yeah. positive. Yeah, fantastic. Well, do you mind playing a song for us? I'd love to. Okay. Let me uh, just double check and make sure that my settings didn't change on me since. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. And and by the way, that quote while you're getting that ready, the quote that quote was Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou, that's right. And she said, "People will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel." And it's it's just it's so true, it's so true. One of the things that I'm fortunate to teach is emotional intelligence, and there's some real emotional intelligence in that quote and and there's some actually some brain science behind it that we form our memories in the same place in our brain where we house our emotions and so we tend to connect emotions with memories in a really strong way and i don't know if you can even hear me right now i know you took your headphones off but that's okay if you can't i, I could not hear you for a little it, bit that's all right it's okay i was just filling some time there while you're getting right in do you need a tune yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. I'm a... So some, I'll just throw some questions that you don't have to answer that, that sure. I was going to ask you while you're getting ready that maybe we can do in part two. Things like, had you not pursued music, what would you have done instead? Um, it, what's the secret sauce to a happy life? What books have been influential on you? What are your guilty pleasures? I have a quote from one of your songs I wanted to ask about. Uh, I, again, I wanted to ask you about your sober journey, and but maybe part two. Well, now I want to know what quote in my song you wanted to ask about. Well, well, I never thought I could be free after all those nights in the DOC. That quote from, from Snow White Knuckles, gave up the cocaine, gave up the gin. You're right. That's too long to answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I, I feel like I've been through AA myself because my wife is, is in the program. And, um, oh. and so, um, uh, that's presumptuous of me to say that, uh, but I, I know a lot more than the average bear and I've been pretty influenced by the whole thing as well, just from that connection. But anyway, what song are you going to play? Well, since you, we mentioned Graham, I'd love to, uh, to play this song that I wrote with Graham. Uh, cool. it's called love is going to come again. And it's also when you, you referenced, um, which is that, uh, this is a song that dropped in, in, I believe 2017. And I, um, I could tell it wasn't right. That's another, just the gut thing, you know, like, how do you know 
when mm. you know it's right. And sometimes I have to go way past the editing point and go, nope, the initial idea was right, which is uh, yeah. what happened with another song on the record. But this one, I just knew it wasn't quite right. And uh, and in the thick of the pandemic, I said, I don't want to abandon this song. And it feels like it's it wants to be a part of this collection of songs. And so I asked Graham if he would write with me on Zoom, and he did. Cool. And, uh, so yeah, this is called Love Is Gonna Come Again. Love is gonna come again Maybe when you're not quite looking Maybe tonight, my friend Maybe when you're driving, love will call And you will fall into a place You never thought you could fit in Love is gonna come again No, you don't believe me yet Stuck inside your head Wondering what you could have said In that bed, love will find you And remind you of the things You thought you'd give up feeling Love is gonna come Lying in your sheets alone Hiding from your telephone As it echoes through your empty home No way of knowing If you'll have anything close to what you had Then Love is gonna come Joy will find its way to you Maybe it'll come with the morning dew Right where those flowers grew Butterflies flew and on their wings They always bring the kind of peace To ease your grieving Love is gonna come Wow, that's beautiful. Thank that's you. really beautiful. That Graham Weber, he's magic. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, Jamie, I've, I've been very lucky on this series to have some really amazing people, but I can tell you already, this is one of my favorite episodes and I really hope that I can get you back for part two. You, uh, you, you've, you've got an amazing charisma. There's something about you. You've got a, you've got a confidence and a humility in a combination that is just, uh, that combined with your talent, you're unstoppable. I, I, uh, I look forward to seeing what happens to you over the coming years, because I think you got a hell of a future ahead of you. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. I, I, I just feel very comfortable with you. I think you ask really engaging questions. And so you made it, you made it easy for me to to feel confident in answering them, which isn't always the case. Well, I assure you. you. <laughs> thank you, Jamie. Thank you so much, and uh, hope to see you down the road soon.